to Marty Gerenser. She's the program manager for the National Good Food Network, and she's going to describe what the network is and what we do. Marty? Hello, everyone. My name is Marty Gerenser. I'm the manager for the National Good Food Network at the Wallace Center. Thank you for being on the webinar today. We're expecting a big crowd, and I know many of you must be on vacation, so we thank you for your time and hope that we share information that's useful to you in building your work. Before we get started, I'd like to share just a little bit more about the National Good Food Network, and then Jeff Farben will introduce our presenters today and the staff from the Wallace Center working on the HUFED initiative. The National Good Food Network started through many discussions with the Wallace Center, myself, key partners, and a lot of different food systems leaders from all around the country, including Brett Malone, who's on the call today. We acknowledged a lot of great work being done on the ground through farmers markets, direct forms of direct marketing, and CSAs, but we saw the opportunity to provide further impact to getting more good food into communities by scaling up, helping our small and medium-sized growers scale up and work in this mainstream food system in an effort to get more good food to more people in rural and urban communities, and in particular those folks with low food access. So the Wallace Center and our food systems leaders, again 20-some advisors that are helping us with this work all around the country, began concepting, visioning, and now managing the work of the Good Food Network. We have 10 different regions working currently around the country, building regional networks and moving forward regional food systems. And again, we span across the country with our regional lead teams as well as with many different partners. And the Wallace Center's focus on market-based solutions and regional food systems, moving more good food to more people, has proven to be a great place to house the NGFN. We believe through the National Good Food Network, we'll be able to increase small and medium-sized grower viability, we'll be able to add economic vitality to our rural and urban areas, and we'll reach children and families where they live, providing more good, healthy food access, in particular in those underserved rural and urban communities around the country. At the national level, the NGFN connects people to people. Those of you working out in the field and working on the ground, we have, the, we have the connections to connect you to regional food systems leaders doing this work so that we can move forward your work and accelerate the work in your regions. We also connect you to models, market-based approaches and accelerating your work and helping you with your on-the-ground work. And we work hard, and the UFED Center is one example of how we try to help you connect to regional and national sources of funding to further your work. The NGFN.org website has proven to be a great place and networking opportunity for folks. Many folks are adding their profile, and we invite you to do that as well, and learn about other folks around the country doing similar work to what you're doing. Partnerships through the NGFN at the Wallace Center with Cisco Corporation is one example of where we work. We're able to aggregate small and medium-sized growers and build their capacity through on-farm and food safety practices and move that food into the mainstream food system through the Cisco warehouse, out to restaurants, hospitals, and universities, but also in, into inner city public schools. We also build community, constantly bringing diverse stakeholders together to help us and help us think about ways to increase our impact. And again, you folks writing in through contact at ngfn.org is, is a great resource and great value, and we read all of your emails. So you know, continue letting us know how to do this work better to serve you. We also work with national collaborators like Community Food Security Coalition and National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition, the Farm to School Networks, USDA, and many others. Here's a quick look at the goals of the NGFN. Again, we work to help supply meat demand through market-based approaches. We operate as an information hub, providing more useful information to you, hopefully that will serve you in moving forward your work, through technical assistance and through regional models. And we're getting more involved in policy and learning ways to serve you all in, in forming our policy makers and work that the NGFN supports. Here's a quick look at the map and in our reach throughout the country. Again, our regional lead teams span 10 different teams and partners throughout, throughout the country. 
And all of this information is available on GFN.org website. Here's, here's the list of our advisory council. Again, these folks worked with us from the beginning to concept and develop this NGFN. These folks are also working on the ground and are also serve as our regional lead teams and inform us at the national level so that we can learn how to better serve you all. And again, this information is available on our website. Links to our regional leads and the work they do is available at NGFN.org as well as their own websites. So that's a quick look at the NGFN.org. Again, we thank you for your comments and suggestions at contact at NGFN. Please stay in touch, keep the information coming, and we'll work to serve you better. Um, now Jeff Farben will We'll present the presenters for today's webinar. And again, thank you for being with us. Thanks, Marty. Um, I just want to give you a sense of the overall outline for the remainder of today's presentation. Uh, we're going to start uh, with an introduction to the HUFED program uh, from the Wallace Center's John Fisk and Michelle Frain Meldoon. Then uh, two of this year's grantees will present. Brett Malone will speak about ALBA's HUFED program, and Brian McNair and Mike Curtin will tell you about the DC Central Kitchen. Michelle will return after the grantee's presentation to give you some details about the focus of the next grant request period. And finally, we'll open the floor for your questions, though uh, you should feel free to type your questions at any time. In fact, I'd like to encourage you to ask your questions early so we can make sure to get to as many as possible. So now let's just jump right into the main program for today. Let me hand the mic off to Dr. John Fisk, the director of the Wallace Center at Winrock International, to introduce you to the HUFED program. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Um, I just want to spend a few minutes uh, setting up uh, a little bit of background and some uh, overview of the center, and then turn it over to Michelle, who will give you more detail. Um, Trying to advance the slides. Jeff, I need my first slide. There we go. So the Wallace Center sits at Winrock International, which is a national oops, sorry about that. Uh, national organization that works uh, in 68 countries. Uh, oops, I need to go back one. All right. 65 countries around the world, really with a focus on empowering the disadvantaged, increasing economic opportunity, and sustaining natural resources. It's that, it's that, uh, that triangle, if you will, that's really critical. We have our headquarters in Little Rock, Arkansas, as well as Arlington, Virginia. Just in uh, general terms, we're broken into three areas, the empowerment and civic engagement, enterprise and agriculture, which is where the Wallace Center sits, as well as our environment group, including forestry, energy, and ecosystem services. The Wallace Center um, sits, again, sits within enterprise and agriculture and really has a focus on supporting entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system with that focus on healthy foods, a healthy environment, and a healthy economy. Um, the Wallace Center really is a national organization. We try to focus on a systems change. We try to, the work that we try to do, uh, try to make it uh, in the future that the system is reinforcing and moves towards sustainability and towards economic viability and environmental sustainability. We tend to work, again, at the national level, but we, we make it a priority to have regional partners, as Marty outlined in the National Good Food Network. That's really populated by strong regional partners. And, and then another piece you need to know is that, you know, when we look at the landscape, we kind of say one of the largest levers for change that we can pull if we want systems change is taking a market-based approach. Now, it's not everything we do, and it's not uh, the only thing we do, but it, it, it seems to be a key lever for change that we're really trying to uh, focus on and pull. Some of the key strategies that we use around that, of course, are creating new knowledge. When we talk about research and knowledge development, uh, new information, uh, we try to foster replicable models, which is really on the ground research, developing new ways of doing things and then doing outreach on that. Um, we also act as an intermediary and a capacity builder. We refund money uh, and grants to targeted areas in a, in a specialized way, and we provide technical assistance to build capacity there. Um, and on top of that, we provide networking opportunities, which we know our partners need in order to learn, and we do outreach around the new knowledge and research that, we, that we've done. So that's the background, and, and you can see the connection between, say, the HUFED program and why it fits really nicely with the Wallace Center. 
let me give you a little bit of history uh, about the HUFED Center per se. Uh, really, this program came out of um, many of our partners' uh, work with USDA and with Congress around the Farm Bill, and really saw a need uh, to to uh, fund this particular type of work. And so it was successful in being put into the Farm Bill and became minded to write funding at that time. Um, and not coincidentally, we have a, a new USDA. We have some new priorities there, which really support this type of work as well, support you know, the issues around healthy eating, around small farm viability, around connecting agriculture to the whole system and not making it separate. And of course, from the White House, we have the Let's Move initiative, which again reinforces these same messages of healthy people, healthy food, healthy economies. Um, and you can see some of the larger trends that are going on around food-related disease, the cost of health care is being questioned. Of course, there's a direct connection between healthy food and that. Um, the movement, the nationwide movement, really the global movement around local and regional supply chain. An interesting um, thing we noted you know, wheat bread for the first time outsells white bread in the U.S. That's, you know, that's a first. So, again, we're making progress. It's a, it's a moment in time that I think the HUFED program really sits. So our vision for the HUFED Center fits within that. So it's a national center dedicated to improving access to healthy and affordable local food for underserved populations across America. So. Some of the main pieces that we want to make you aware of are that we're really trying to address the bottlenecks. If you think about that su supply chain, there's production and there's consumption and then there's a whole chain in between. And when it comes to healthy food, when it comes to local and regional food, there are infrastructure bottlenecks, there are people-to-people uh, -people type bottlenecks that have kind of gone by the wayside because of the, you know, in a sense it's become a large business, a big business that's a global and a, and a national business and so those other connections have gone. Reestablishing those is something that we want to do through this, uh, through this center program. It's market-based. It's a social enterprise approach. The idea is to invest in enterprises that will eventually be self-supporting, if not totally, in a large part. That is taking advantage of that force of continuity out there. So that really makes, marks it as different from many of the other type of programs making this unique. The way that we implement uh, is around grant making. As you, can, as you will see later today. Uh, and along with each grant, we offer technical assistance, whether it be general technical assistance like a webinar, or whether it be specific technical assistance um, around marketing or around some kind of production practice to that particular grantee, so a range of services. And I think it's important to note that in our vision, it's not a standalone program, that it creates partnerships and connections, for example, to the National Good Food Network, which exists because of lots of other investment from others or, for example, other sources of financing. You know, if grantees get to the point where they're, where they're a healthy and a good investment, they might benefit from some investment dollars from, say, a social, social enterprise investment fund. Can we, can we make those, help make those connections for our grantees? That's part of our vision. So that's kind of the 30,000 foot. Let me take you, uh, offer you to uh, speak with Michelle Muldoon now, who will tell you more about the specifics of the program uh, and where we're going in the future. You know, Michelle is uh, optimal to be managing this program, I just want to say, because she has a lot of experience in designing, improving and running social change and community development projects, not just here in the U.S., uh, but across the globe. Uh, her career includes stints with a Fortune 500 company with the university, and she's worked several years with Rodale Institute's experimental research farm on issues relating to uh, farm and marketing and food marketing and sustainably grown products. So she brings a wealth of knowledge and leadership um, and I think it's, uh, it's to all of our benefits. So with that, let me turn it over to Michelle. Thank you, John, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we have a pretty tight schedule today, so I'll be going fairly quickly through my slides, but I want to assure everybody that later on we will be uh, having a technical webinar that will just discuss the strategy and the technical details of the program. So I'll try to uh, give everybody a general sense of what's going on technically uh, and strategically, and then again, uh, we will be offering another webinar that will go into detail for anybody interested in more. So, um, John laid the background of the Wallace Hewitt Center. Uh, I manage the day-to-day -day details of it, and I'll just give you some background on that. So we're right now in ending up 
uh, we're, we're right now in year one of a three-year uh, grant of which we were sole recipient from the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, we, the Wallace Hufford Center, is both, uh, you know, the value in the, the Hufford Center is that we're one-stop shop, so we can both be a national point on food access to underserved populations as well as reach out at the local level uh, and everywhere in, in between in partnership with National Good Food Network. Um, and I also want to illustrate and underscore that the USDA currently is placing a, a, a heavy emphasis on healthy food access across its various units or agencies within the department. And so we therefore have um, a lot of support and allies at USDA around this topic. Uh, the HUFET Center, as John mentioned, um, we're basically, um, you know, to, to um, to, to, we're, we're a national center dedicated to improving access to healthy, affordable food for underserved populations. Uh, we're doing this by way of technical assistance and uh, grant making, and we're uh, working with three different kinds of grants. Uh, small enterprise, which is uh, you know, focused on uh, filling uh, specific bottlenecks that have been identified that are preventing um, you know uh, healthy food from uh, moving forward and if we just had that one little investment things could move forward uh, and it could make a big difference or a return and then we have large enterprise grants which are multiple year multiple objectives much larger in scope and then we're also funding feasibility studies for programs that have been uh, more or less validated already and have a little bit of research to back them and then this is just a, uh, the feasibility study to, to confirm it and, and move on into a business plan. Um, the goals and objectives of the program center around four major goals uh, and these are required actually for eligibility for even applying or being involved with the program. Um, first off, there's improved food access. It's assumed that you know we are definitely working it with getting more socially and economically equitable access to high quality affordable fresh foods to communities with healthy food deficits secondly um, there's an emphasis on you know small and mid-sized producer incomes and economic sustainability so opening up opportunities for farmers and having that urban rural link um, also market-based approaches uh, I think that if you walk away with anything today we have to realize that this is an this is an enterprise approach. It's market-based change approach. We are looking at addressing food access uh, using business enterprise, um, you know, innovative entrepreneurial approaches that are hopefully economically sustainable as well. And then finally, it's assumed that all of the grants that we work with and the enterprises that we fund will be sharing the learning and that we will be capturing this learning and sharing it with others so that the stories can be, you know, the, the successes can be replicated and that what does not work can be learned from as well. As far as our objectives, uh, we're basically, uh, we're looking at grant making and technical assistance to reduce supply chain bottlenecks, as I mentioned. These are, you know, specific bottlenecks within the supply chain or within the processes that, you know, if they were addressed, you know, could really move uh, more food forward and, and get it to underserved uh, communities. We're also um, <clears throat> looking at uh, increasing healthy local food in mainstream distribution channels and by that we mean you know increasing the flow of healthy fresh and local food being distributed by resellers, wholesalers, private marketing channels, supermarket, warehouses, school food service providers, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, lastly we have as an objective to increase availability and volume um, Oh, I'm sorry, number three, uh, increasing number of retail sites marketing healthy food. So looking at actually uh, increasing the number of retail sites, this is re referencing new retail sites. And then number four, increasing availability and volume of healthy food in current retail. So getting more volume and availability of healthy food options within existing sites. The approach that we're taking to reach the objectives and how we're looking at the grant making process is through this approach. Number one, it's critical and required that anybody working, uh, applying for the program or for a grant um, has a demonstrated need uh, and, and has uh, you know, research and data to back that the, the, the audiences and communities that they're serving are truly underserved. 
Um, we went around back and forth on the term underserved, um, the way that we're defining it and the way that it's written in the legislation for HUFED is, you know, we're working with populations that have been historically um, and at times chronically disadvantaged or um, left out of, um, you know, traditional funding access and then also underserved in terms of uh, not having access to, uh, to healthy food. And then there's an emphasis on working with um, African Americans, uh, American Indians and Latino women also looking at uh, limited resource, low income producers um, and others that have been um, traditionally underserved. So that has to be demonstrated, um, you know, absolutely. And then the market based change piece of it is extremely important and so we looked at, uh, you know, we're looking at some of the most innovative models out there that are entrepreneurial, using a business kind of model um, to tackle food access issues. We're looking at those that are looking at it from a systems approach, um, urban rural linkages, um, you know, not just urban, not just rural, connecting the two, looking at it from a multi-stakeholder systems approach, regional approach. And it's also assumed that it's not a one-size-fits-all model in America. We have various geographies. We have different people, different communities, different cultures. And so therefore, we strive, strived in, year, in this year and will continue to strive to uh, fund a diversity of innovative models of different types and then different approaches and then also looking at different regions of the country and also looking at different audiences um, and, and different different backgrounds. So year one, we uh, did a grant making process in the last six months and we started with letters of interest, which is like a five page mini proposal that we did. And then from there we selected full proposals. And let me just highlight, um, first of all, that we, res we had a phenomenal response. And I think that this response is really um, illustrative of, of the need out there and the, the creative ideas and innovative thinking that is out there and the demand for funding far outweighed what we could actually fund. So we received 538, um, 538 letters of interest from which we really knew we could only fund about 10. So as you can see, this is quite a challenge. So we, we invited 47 to submit full proposals and from there we had 13 awards. Um, the categories of the enterprises that were selected, uh, here's the breakdown of the categories. Business and social enterprise, value chain support, equipment purchases, um, food safety, uh, EBT, SNAP, WIC, nutrition, education, community outreach. Okay. Uh, the year one grants, uh, small enterprises, we have uh, three small enterprise grants that are listed there on the slide. Uh, large enterprise grants um, uh, there as well, and one of them is, is, is speaking shortly. And then feasibility study grants, um, one. And we've got eight of 13 so far. There are five that are still pending approval, uh, so we'll have had 13 in year one. So now we're going to have... Um, you know, spotlight two two of our grantees from two different sides of the country. First, we've got ALBA, uh, Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association in Salinas, California, and then we'll have DC Central Kitchen, uh, Washington DC surrounding states. Um, ALBA is working, uh, has been awarded a large enterprise grant to expand and improve long-term economic viability of the ALBA organics through third-party food safety certification and to increase sales to retailers and institutional and school buyers serving low-income communities. Brett Malone is executive director of ALBA. He'll be speaking shortly. And he's based in Salinas, California. ALBA promotes economic viability, social equity, and ec ecological land management among limited resource and aspiring farmers on California's central coast. ALBA Organics is ALBA's licensed produce distributor that works on behalf of ALBA program participants and other family farmers in the region to market their organic products and ensure their story is conveyed with their products. ALBA Organics sold $1.25 million in fresh produce in 2009, serving approximately 30 farmers and diverse sales channels, including institutional food service, retail, wholesale, and CSA hybrid models. There's much more, but I'll let uh, Brett talk about it. Brett? Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. 
So I think, um, Michelle, you gave a good <laughs> overview. What else is there to say? No, there's a lot to say. Um, and I'll be giving you some details about Alba Organics. Alba Organics is the enterprise, if you will, that is being supported by the HUFED grants. And Alba Organics um, is essentially a project of Alba, the Agriculture and Land-Based Training Association. And just to give you a little context, um, Alba is located in the Salinas Valley um, salad bowl of the country, um, if not the world. And we have um, a high uh, farm worker population, high rates of persistent poverty, um, lots of um, chronic disease um, you know, related to diet. Um, and so that's the context that we're working in. And the, let's see here. There we go. So, whoops, there we go, okay. So ALBA, the, the parent organization, is a nonprofit and we own and operate two organic farms in Monterey County that essentially are um, farm business um, incubator sites. And we currently have 40 beginning uh, and limited resource farmers operating businesses on those two farms. Our budget is approximately $3 million, uh, of which a bit more than half for 2010 is going to be derived from produce sales um, through Alba Organics. So Alba Organics is, again, a licensed wholesale produce distributor licensed by the um, State um, Department of Food and Agriculture. It's a cost center or a project of the nonprofit Alba. We are looking at um, spinning off Alba Organics as a separate corporation in the near future, um, given the, the size that it's grown to. What Alba Organics does essentially is to aggregate fresh organic produce um, from the farmers that participate in our education programs or in our incubator uh, at our incubator farms as well as other family farmers in the region. And we serve wholesale, retail, food service, and other um, direct marketing distribution um, channels. Alba Organics, uh, we consider a social enterprise, um, again, which um, primarily serves the, the Alba small farm incubator participants. The enterprise is, is definitely mission driven, but we also uh, have a goal of supporting the financial stability of, of Alba. So Alba Organics supports Alba's mission, which you, which Michelle already um, shared with us. And the way we do that is by providing access to wholesale markets through the aggregation of fresh produce. And Alba Organics is very much linked to the education and technical assistance that Alba provides. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about how that happens. But essentially, um, Alba Organics begins to work with graduates of our farmer education program that uh, are now farming in our incubator by continuing to provide marketing education, uh, production planning, support. Sorry, this is on um, time. Bear with me, please. Um, Post-harvest handling, um, sales technical assistance. And we, uh, again, we have 40 farmers in the incubator right now, and then we work with 10 to 15 other growers in the area. So just to give you a sense of the market channels um, and our, our sales. So it, you can see in 2008 our sales were about 560,000. Uh, 2009 they grew to 1.25 million and in 2010, this is our fiscal year which ends um, September 30th, we're anticipating sales of $2 million at Alba Organics which is tremendous. We really weren't anticipating um, this, that much growth um, this year. The breakdown in terms of channel, sales channels, you know, nearly half of it, and this breakdown is for 2009, but it'll be quite similar for 2010. Sorry about this. Um, it's almost half wholesale, 43%, 25% um, institutional food service, including 
universities um, and um, K through 12 schools, um, and then 19% uh, retail, 13% um, home delivery services, kind of the market basket, CSA type models. Um, so wholesale, selling to other wholesalers is our is our bread and butter, but food service is definitely a, a growing component. So the in terms of the QFED project specifically, this was a, a great opportunity for Alba Organics to be able to really focus on, from Alba Organics perspective, connecting the beginning limited resource and socially disadvantaged farmers that Alba serves with the um, with the low income communities that surround us. Interestingly, the vast majority of produce not only that is grown in the Salinas Valley by um, you know, larger scale growers that, that our area is known for, but the growers that Alba works with, most of their product is exported out of the area going up to the Silicon Valley and the Bay Area because that's where more lucrative markets are. Um, we have been working diligently over the last several years trying to find ways to connect the local low-income communities with the produce that our farmers are producing. And we have um, a campaign going on with farmers markets and a top-up campaign doing some incentives with the farmers markets and EBT recipients. But from the Alba Organics perspective, uh, it's been really challenging to find ways to reach low-income consumers. So we're, we do serve um, a handful of, um, of school um, K-12 through K-12 food service and you know that serve a large percentage of um, free and reduced lunch recipients. So we're going to be looking at in this project how we can work with these schools and make that business model sustainable. A lot of the money that they have available to purchase local produce is, is our grants. You know, we want to find ways to for them to be able to sustain their local purchasing. Um, food safety certification is 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 the second um, area that we're going to be focusing on in this grant, and it has a twofold um, purpose. One is to expand access to markets overall, while also being proactive in terms of um, fulfilling expectations of, of food safety in the marketplace. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, but also being able to having the food safety certification go for the individual growers as well as for Apple Organics, the distributor, is going to provide more confidence and more opportunities in the um, school markets. And thirdly, we have been working on a Healthy Corner Store initiative locally and as part of the Healthy Corner Store network, trying to find ways to, again, connect the small retailers in our area that serve low-income communities with local produce. And it has been extremely challenging uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, we are looking at working with the individual stores in collaboration with the small business development centers, looking at what the, what the business model um, is for uh, connecting the local produce with low-income low -income consumers while also working um, in community engagement so that there is demand for those products. That's, so those are essentially the goals um, for our project. The Alba Organics core competencies are essentially providing source verified certified organic produce with a story. The story of most of the farmers that sell through Alba Organics are or formerly were uh, farm workers. Um, we do customized crop planning with our customers and, the, and our farmers and again providing sales and marketing training for the growers that we work with. So some of what we do is to provide um, technical assistance in the field, whether it be on pest control or harvest timing, those types of things. This is an example of um, actually a pest control advisor that Alba was able to bring on contract um, working with, with individual growers. Here in the next slide is an example of a crop that was planned specifically um, for a particular customer, and this is something that we've been working on with, with, with more customers, bringing um, chefs and food buyers to the farm, um, sitting down to work directly with Alba Organic staff and farmers. Um, and it's an iterative process, but we 
we've definitely been refining it and having markets that farmers can count on and plan for is really what we're what we're after and that are obviously economically viable. To give you a sense of some of the things that we do in terms of education, this is a um, post-harvest handling workshop that we have held the last few years and it's both for growers that are new to wholesale and also for others as a refresher. So it covers um, you know, basically um, pack and post-harvest handling for wholesale markets, which are the most demanding markets in terms of quality um, and spec relative to retail and, and food service. So some examples of pack and things that we look at in those workshops. And let's see here. An example of the Alba Organics label um, in a um, clamshell of raspberries that we get great compliments on. And the um, our box that we were able to um, start using last year, which has also helped to increase um, brand recognition in the marketplace. So here, just to give you a sense of the of our um, of our warehouse, which is about 3,000 square feet, we have two bays in there with, with different temperatures to be able to um, store um, products. You know, that requires cooler um, temperatures, and others that require warmer temperatures. Um, the food safety certification is going to. Um, we've already started implementing some changes. We're going to be working with um, NSF Davis Fresh, and we're looking at a um, the group certification option um, where all of the growers that we work with. Sorry about the slides advancing. Um, would be certified as would Alba Organics, and so we're probably going to be starting with a a small core group of growers um, that would get certified first and work out the kinks and then work up to having all the growers that we work with certified. Um, so here is just a sense of some of the customers um, by name that Alba Organics serves. Um, there are a few other school districts that we work with and as I said earlier, the food safety certification, you know, on one hand, we're working to be proactive. We haven't had any customers demand food safety certification from us, and that is with, the, um, with that sales growth that we have seen. However, we all know that it's something that we need to be prepared to deal with, and we are anticipating that we, we have been told that having that certification will open up new markets for us as well. Um, and again, with the working with schools and with stores in low income that serve low income communities, we really want to um, figure out together with them how what the business model is that's going to be sustainable in the context of schools, how can this how can they not have to rely on grant funds to be sourcing local and regional produce. Um, and for the stores, um, produce for large retailers is a loss leader. And so what is the business model for small retailers that want to sell local and regional produce? Um, both on the school front and the retailers community engagement um, is going to be key um, to building adequate demand. Uh, one of our trucks that we have on the road that we're, we um, need to buy a new one. <laughs> Infrastructure is ongoing um, challenge. Some of the um, the products that are offered in a salad bar with um, signage at the UC Santa Cruz um, dining hall. And a display at a promotional event at a, low, a, a um, small grocer in Salinas selling um, organic strawberries. One of the things that we've been working on over the last several years is to adapt the Buy Fresh, Buy Local campaign, which is led by Community Alliance with Family Farmers here in California. We 
um, adapted it and translated it into Spanish. And so we have uh, materials that we um, basically can um, utilize to sign up retailers and farmers uh, to participate in the campaign. So we've been using that as we've been working with retailers and most recently we've been able to start working with um, street food vendors um, and connecting them with local producers. And here in the next slide is an example of um, a um, street food vendor um, selling at a UPIC event that we held last year um, that was able to source from Alba Farmers and that's one of the types of things that we're going to be working on, building on. So we are um, really excited about this next phase of our work and really as you know, I think folks in a lot of parts of the country are trying to do is you know, trying to you know, really crack the nut of how can um, you know, limited resource and socially disadvantaged producers be serving um, low-income communities and, and, it's, and it's tough, but we're, we're making some inroads. And so thank you for the opportunity to present and I look forward to questions. Thank you, Britt. So now we have um, DC Central Kitchen, which is another um, large enter enterprise award recipient. Um, we're going to be uh, working with them to expand. They'll be expanding local purchasing, adding three new kitchen shifts to process the food um, that they procure locally, mostly, um, uh, into nutritious meals. We'll tell you all about it for low-income communities. Um, they also provide 4,000 meals a day for uh, homeless shelters, and they'll explain everything. Uh, Mike Curtin is the um, is the executive director of DC Central Kitchen, and uh, Mike comes to DC Central Kitchen after a 20-year career in the hospitality business, much, most of which has been spent in Washington DC and Northern Virginia. And with a focus on organizational design and training, he's focused on redefining DC Central Kitchen departments and creating new positions that have allowed it to run more efficient efficiently. Um, after graduating from Williams College with a BA in religion, Mike lived and worked in Osaka, Japan for three years. It was then that Mike decided he wanted to open a restaurant back in the States. After returning to the Washington area, he worked at the Hay Adams Hotel, uh, the Dixie Grill at McCormick and Schmicks on K Street before opening his own restaurant. Uh, in addition to growing the many programs at the kitchen, Mike has focused on expanding social enterprise efforts. Um, and in 2009, 46% of the revenue raised by DC Central Kitchen, roughly $3 million, was the result of social enterprise and employment projects. Uh, Brian McNair, who's going to be talking uh, and presenting the activities of DC Central Kitchen, is the Chief Development Officer for DC Central Kitchen, and he's responsible for fundraising, public relations, communications, um, Fresh Start, and the Campus Kitchens Project, and in addition, he works on um, development of new projects and program expansion with the CEO, Mike Curtin. Um, he and his team raise over $3 million in annual funds through events, appeals, grants, and by cultivating solid, long-lasting partnerships by telling their story. And before coming to DC Central Kitchen, Brian worked for nonprofits for more than 15 years in New York City, and then he changed careers to become a chef, first with his own catering business in New York, and then as sous chef for various restaurants in Virginia. And Brian's favorite part of DC Central Kitchen is the 12-week personal transformation that occurs for participants in the kitchen's culinary job training program, and he'll tell you all about that. Brian? Okay, welcome. Uh, this, this is actually Mike. Uh, Brian's going to be chiming in, and I uh, just want to say great, wildly cool stuff, Brett. That's uh, awesome to hear what you're doing out there. Uh, so let, let's start this with a, a little background on DC Central Kitchen, DCCK. Uh, our mission is using food as a tool to... Am I going here, Jeff? There we go. Strengthen bodies, uh, feeding good people or feeding good food to folks in the shelter, social service agencies throughout D.C. Uh, we are focused on nutrition as opposed to sustenance. Uh, the folks you see in that picture there are some of our culinary job trainees. As uh, Michelle mentioned, Jeff, help me out here, man. This is 
There we go. Okay. Uh, empowering minds. Uh, the, the, the main way we, we do uh, empower minds is, is, is through this culinary job training program. There are four 12-week programs a week or, or a year where we take men and women predominantly coming out of prison, many in recovery from addiction, um, and train them not only in culinary arts but in the life skills. We call them personal empowerment skills. They're going to need not just to get their job or a job but to keep that job and to be productive members of society in the future. We also work with a lot of children's organizations with what we call our, our Healthy Returns program, and teaching nutrition and working with uh, the, uh, the agencies that serve under, uh, underprivileged kids in our community, and engaging last year over 13,000 volunteers to bring them into the kitchen to work with our, our staff, again, most of whom are, are uh, graduates of our job training program, uh, to, to prepare and deliver the 45 now 100 meals that we do every single day that goes out into the greater D.C. metro area. So for many years, people have described D.C. Central Kitchen mostly because of the training program that we have uh, by using the old proverb that I think just about every culture has co-opted at one point or another, give someone a fish, feed them for a day, teach someone to fish, feed them for a lifetime. And we've certainly been doing that, and that's been fantastic. But, but the line is still there, and sadly, the line still keeps growing. And our aim is to shorten that line by the way that we feed it. So what we really need to do now is we need to learn a new way to fish. Uh, there are two facts that when we started thinking about this that we had to confront. And one was that the donated food that we had been counting on and using for years to prepare the thousands of meals that we do every day was really uh, decreasing, mostly because the businesses from which we were getting this food were, were better at their businesses. Uh, so food that's extra, uh, in essence, you can look at the food bank system as saying it, it, it's a system that is based on bad business and poor ordering, uh, mismanagement of, of inventory and stock is, is declining. The other fact that we, we looked at, that while, while this, on one hand, this uh, uh, market or revenue stream, if you will, of food that what we were relying on was declining, we were recognizing that there were still hundreds of millions of pounds of fresh, good, whole food out in the fields that were rotting there. That's where most of the food waste now that we experience as a country comes from, um, for two basic reasons. One is aesthetically, it's not what we expect to eat as, as American consumers, or there's also significant distribution issues that are preventing that food from making it from the fields and the farms into urban areas, kitchens, schools, corner stores, some of which you heard Brett talk about earlier. So we needed to approach this problem from a, a, a radically different perspective than we had been operating for many, many years as a nonprofit, going to folks and saying, hey, give us what you have left over. Um, which is great, but that idea of charity uh, being based on, on extra or left over just isn't a sustainable business model. And when we talk about sustainability, we, we really need to think of it, you know, if you will, with a capital S and what that means for the community, for the farmers, for the individuals, uh, both folks that, that are, are financially stable and those that aren't, as well as organizations like ALBA and DC Central Kitchen and many of the other Fed grantees. So we said, let's, let's approach this from a business standpoint and go out to these farmers and growers and talk about buying product that they probably wouldn't be able to sell and probably would be plowed under or just left rotting in their field. So if you look at this slide, on, um, on your right, we have three cucumbers that we've purchased from a local grower in the Shenandoah Valley. On the left are three cucumbers that I randomly picked out of a bin at a, uh, a giant grocery store up near my house. Um, so obviously the, the ones on the right wouldn't have made the grade to get to Giant or Whole Foods or Safeway or Piggly Wiggly or wherever, you know, some of these large markets, mostly because they wouldn't fit, the, the maximum number of them couldn't fit in the, in the packaging boxes, they wouldn't stack well, they wouldn't be appealing to customers buying these products, but when you cut them up and put them in salads or use them like we do, this is exactly what they look like. 
The same thing, of course, is true with, with all sorts of produce and uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, this is another example that we just took a photo of. This is our, our sweet potatoes that, again, we source locally at pennies on the pound. And this is what they look like when we cut them up before we either cook them up, roast them off, put them into salads, marinate them for some other use. So when we talk about sustainability, as I mentioned before, we really want to look uh, larger than um, what, you know, for, for many years, I myself, I have to say, my version of sustainability was getting my burlap sack every Saturday morning and marching dutifully up to the farmer's market and buying local food that I was probably only going to use for a couple days back at my house and then fall back on, on whatever else I had uh, get from the grocery store. But we need to look at this in a much larger picture. And we started with the farmers. So purchasing these seconds or unclassifieds are going to auction, which we are doing a lot now, particularly in the Shenandoah, and buying their first at what we refer to as a fair trade price. Now, there are some purists, I guess, who would argue that a fair trade price means um, higher than one would normally expect to pay in a, in a regular market, if you will. Uh, but the way I'm looking at this, or we're looking at this, is that uh, if a farmer was basically getting nothing for this product, yet they were having to spend money to plant it and, and cultivate it and ultimately pick it, uh, getting something for that is certainly fair trade and above what they were getting market. Uh, Low-income communities, the, the, the 4,500 meals that we serve now are going out with predominantly local food, not only produce, but dairy and protein as well. Most of the men and women and children that we feed that we serve through the shelters and the other agencies are very medically compromised, medically vulnerable folks. So, and if, if we know that if we can get them, this, this whole food, nutritious food, it hasn't been um, contaminated with pesticides or uh, steroids or any other chemicals, they're going to be in a p better position to get out of that shelter and move forward with a productive life. Uh, this is Brian just chiming in. I, I like to say this. I'm not sure I uh, can confirm it, but I think we're probably the only city in, in, in America whose shelters are, are eating local product or local boars. All the city shelters are eating 70% local product. And, and, it, and it's, it's unfortunate to say, but, but the, the, the folks in the shelters here in D.C. Uh, have been eating better probably than most of the, uh, the D.C. public school students. Um, although D.C. is trying to make a change in that, and, and if things continue to go well, we'll be running a pilot program in seven D.C. public schools uh, once the school year starts. So this whole program, so we got the farmers, we have the local community, and now we're talking about the local economy. Um, what we are looking at uh, as, as really the end result, or one of our huge goals in terms of developing the social enterprises, are, is our ability to create jobs to hire our culinary uh, job training graduates into. Um, it's one thing to hire, to, to train, and to put them in a position to get a job, but if, we, if, if they can't find meaningful gainful employment, then ultimately we might we could say what we're doing really isn't, isn't working, and it's not worth it, and we're spending resources that, that aren't going to uh, ultimately help the community. Um, when, before we head on to this next thing, I just want to throw out a couple really quick numbers for you folks. Um, so we'll just go back here for a sec. Um, to keep someone in prison in, uh, in, in our country roughly costs about $40,000. It costs us roughly about 10000 to train someone. Our national recidivism rate, those folks who would reoffend and go back to prison in a year, uh, is 65%. In D.C. it happens to be 73%. So you just think about the money that we're spending by putting people back into jail because we can't find them jobs. Our recidivism rate for folks that have, have been in prison, come to our program, graduate, is less than 3%. So again, engaging, now we're engaging the local community, and we're doing that, as I mentioned earlier, by having thousands of more volunteers come in and help us put this, this product into the system. This happens to be a group of of young folks, but they, they're, they're coming all ages and, and literally from around the country. And we, in fact, created three new evening shifts, in, which, was, which was previously downtime in our kitchen. We created three new evening shifts for people that can come 5 to 8 p.m. every day, fill our kitchen, and do nothing but process local produce, and that's actually being increased to five shifts this year.
So th this is one of our freezer units, and this is all local product that we've uh, sliced at one of those volunteer chefs that Brian was just talking about, blanched, vacuum sealed, frozen, that we're now using not only for our, our own purposes, but selling this product to other nonprofit partners in the, in the area that are also doing meals and are also relying on purchasing food from national or international wholesalers. So we're able to sell them product, better product, at a lower price and reduce their, their costs as well. Um, we're now we're moving this to restaurants uh, and other institutional food service providers, whether they're schools, hospitals, um, re or restaurants. Um, we've taken this food and put it into now two schools. This is a shot of one of them, the Washington Jesuit Academy, which is a middle school for at-risk boys. The gentleman, Dwayne, in the center there in the Fresh Start DC Central Kitchen chef's outfit is uh, the, the lead cook up there. He, again, he did a fair amount of time in prison, made some mistakes, got out, came to our program, changed his life, and has not only become a cook, and someone who's providing nutrition for these boys, these at-risk boys, but has become a mentor to them as well. Uh, this is an 11-month out-of-the-year program, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., so we do three meals a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We do a full local salad bar at lunch and dinner every day. Uh, and I'm amazed every time I go up there that I see these boys uh, going back to the unlimited fruit and salad bar and filling up their plates and eating this food. And as many of you, I'm sure, know that uh, one of the, the uh, a common negative or a reason why we can't do this kind of food in schools is because people say, oh, the kids will never eat that. They, they won't eat things like uh, local, or tilapia with uh, uh, Brussels sprouts in, uh, in brown butter or uh, artichoke souffle or some of the other rice pilaf dishes that we're doing with them. Um, the answer that I have to that is, Yes, they will uh, if that's what you serve them for lunch. If you offer them a bad uh, pepperoni pizza or a cheeseburger with processed grain-fed beef, yes, they probably will go for that. But if this is what you feed them and, this, and you teach them why this is good and where this food comes from, we take them out to the farms with us. These guys have a garden now. They're doing composting. It's really quite remarkable. And the teachers, to a one, have said how this improves – has improved the attention span in class, the grades, um, their, their productivity, their attitudes. It's remarkable. So here, I, I have to apologize because I think we, when we were looking at this, we, 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 were, we pulled some older slides, um, but th these are illustrative. This is just when we were starting our, our process and to just showing the, the food, that the, the, the purchase the food cost of, of the food that we were, again, already purchasing. The beauty of this whole program is this is not new money that we had to find to go out and pay to the farmers. This was already money that we were spending with a wholesaler. Not that that's bad and they're in business and they've been very helpful to us, but I'm much more interested in us taking our resources, using them effectively and efficiently, again, going back to the very early slides, to build and create communities locally right where we are. So even though we're, we're radically increasing the amount of food, the poundage of food that we're purchasing, we're reducing the amount of money we are spending on food. And this, this is just a, uh, a, a price comparison of uh, what we're paying with one of our local farmers. This one happens to be a guy named Mark Toygo up in Pennsylvania in Shippensburg. Um, in the blue versus Cisco uh, national wholesale price uh, in the purple on the right. So you can see that the, the, the just the market difference in 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 the cost of these products. And again, uh, one of the um, uh, arguments that people make that to counter this idea of getting local food into the urban uh, food system, whether it's through shelters or through schools or through corner stores, is the cost. And what we're working and have shown and are continuing to work, and with this QFED grant we'll, we'll do to an even greater level, is, is show that if you, you're creative in creating distribution networks, um, this local food can 
actually be sourced at a significantly discounted cost than what it would cost to buy it from the, again, the national wholesalers, whether it's coming from, in our case, when I say we're at the East Coast, so California is not local for us, nor is Mexico, nor is Central America. Uh, so we, we can indeed get this um, significant volume, quality of, of product at a very reasonable cost. Um, and, I, and I have to say, one of the things that we talk about often is that when we started this whole program about three years ago, um, the, I, I was not thinking, we were not thinking, that we were doing this to be the green guys or to, to be part of this, that, that part of the sustainability movement. We were looking at this with, with quite frankly, enlightened self-interest and said, we're spending a ton of money on food, and it's just not good food. There has to be a better way to do this. And we looked at the resources we had. We have trucks. We do a tremendous amount of, of, we produce a tremendous amount of meals every day. We have a labor force that wants to help us do this. And we, we have a, uh, with the volunteers, and then we also have a labor force that we've created with our culinary job training graduates to bring all of these things together. And then all of these other social enterprises have generated from that so much so that uh, by the by, the end of next week, we will sign a lease for a 6,500 square foot commercial kitchen, where we will move all of our social enterprise processing and wholesaling businesses to about 15 minutes down the road here in DC from DC Central Kitchen. So, um, this is a, a wildly exciting time for us. Um, we're very happy to be able to share this with you, and we're very excited with uh, to have our, uh, the Wallace Center at Windrock International as, as our one of our partners to bring this program uh, to other people around the country. I got the two-minute warning there, so I, I think I hit it just about on. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, so we're, we're getting into the end of the webinar, and I want to leave enough uh, room for questions and answer. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're going to be doing a webinar specifically targeting, you know, just the technical aspects of the program and, you know, the kinds of things like who's eligible and what the criteria are and tips and things like that. But what I can tell you right now is that over the next three years, again, we're at the end of year one, we've got two years left, uh, we'll be looking at funding, a, you know, a diverse portfolio of about 30 grants, uh, a combination of small and large enterprise uh, and feasibility studies. And again, that diversity of, you know, different regions, different models, uh, you know, and just to name a few, rattle off a few things of what we're funding this year, of, of what people are working with. Um, you know, we've got mobile vendor trucks, healthy corner stores, rural food hub, uh, cooperative regional food storage processing and distribution. We've got market makeovers, mobile farm markets, uh, bottleneck of labeling and insurance requirements. Alba mentioned food safety and certification. Uh, you know, a wholesale farm to school, and then in terms of the underserved populations that, that, that they're serving, we've got the whole gamut as well from, you know, of course, low in across the board, they're mostly low income, uh, school, school children, women, immigrants, uh, African American, uh, different, um, you know, different different backgrounds. We've got Detroit, we've got Philadelphia, East Los Angeles, uh, you know, so on and so forth. But it's to let you know that, um, you know, we're open to exploring um, anything provided that there are two main things that are covered. One is that, you know, that the enterprises that we work with are meeting the specific objectives of the grant, uh, the HUFED, Wallace HUFED Center and the HUFED legislation and are, um, you know, tying into the trends of, of, of what's going on at the national and the regional level, I mean the national and the federal level, and then, you know, have a justifiably and researched and backed, um, you know, need and are truly serving the, uh, the underserved communities and can demonstrate that. And um, I also encourage everybody to take a look at the Food Desert Study and the Food Atlas uh, by USDA. Um, they have some uh, statistics as well, and the U.S. Census Bureau and other stats, of course. Um, so the process is going to be as follows. We'll be making an announcement mid to end of September, uh, describing the entire grant-making process, and it's going to go as, you know, with the letters of interest again, uh, where we'll invite and we'll provide all of the instructions and the templates and what's required for these, you know, letters of interest, which will be very short, 
very concise uh, mini micro proposals and then the finalists from those will be invited to submit full proposals. Uh, so we're looking at the you know the LOIs in October and then the full proposals in November and then our final selection uh, occurring in December and then the USDA uh, uh, approvals and all of the final, uh, you know, T's crossed and I's dotted uh, in the early winter of 2011. Uh, again, we will be doing a webinar later. I encourage all of you to contact us if you have any questions after this webinar. We have a hotline. The phone number is listed on the uh, the slide there, sub area code 703-531-8810. Um, we have staff available to um, to to answer any questions you may have. If it's a, a longer call that's necessary, we can schedule a call with you. Uh, there's also an email box that we have. It's hufed, H-U-F-E-D, at winrock.org. And be sure also to sign up for our mailing list so that you can be notified immediately when the guidelines and the grant making um, process is released and the RFA is out. Uh, and you can go to the link there, the wallacecenter.org forward slash sign up and check the box for Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center. Okay, great. Well, I want to, uh, there are several great questions out there, uh, and I want to try to answer as many as possible, um, or, or not me answer, but uh, ask them. Um, so actually, um, John, perhaps this is a good question for you. Um, Cynthia asks how essential the urban-rural connection is in the Hugh Fed grants. Uh, she's interested in an, the urban-urban connection. Jeff, uh, how about repeating the question? I didn't quite Sure, no problem. Um, Cynthia is asking about the, the, how essential the urban-rural connection is in the Hugh Fed grants. They're interested in urban-urban connections. Good question. Um, a lot of what we're trying to focus on in this program is less about direct marketing and more about the supply chain. We're trying to build models using an enterprise approach to scale things up to some degree. So one of the concerns we have about urban to urban is that much of it is around um, smaller gardens that may be feeding directly to people. And that's a great idea and, it, and it's essential, but it's not always a market-based approach. It's not usually a supply chain approach. So to the, ex to the extent that it does, you know, um, represent a supply chain where you're removing a barrier, addressing a barrier, and it's market-based, and it's urban to urban, then yes, it qualifies. But a lot of what we saw, I mean, we got, like Michelle said, we got over 500 uh, letters of interest, and a significant number of those were focused really on this more direct marketing, direct piece that didn't have much marketing to it. A lot of, it was a lot of urban production, very, very small, and those did not score as well. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, there's a question for the DC Central Kitchen about uh, the use of the HUFED grant funds in particular, which is to say uh, how, what is uh, the, the plan for, for using the funds, how have you used the, the funds? So this is a good question from Mike O'Brien. Mike O'Brien. Mm -hmm. Brian, you there? Well, okay. Um, there are a, a couple a couple different areas where we're, we're going to use this. When we were looking at this grant to begin with, the commissary or the satellite location that I mentioned at the end of the presentation was really more of a, a dream, and it quickly became a reality. So what we were looking to use the funds here in DC Central Kitchen, in our headquarters, if you will, with what we're doing already. So uh, I was just in the middle of actually answering a question about our trucks and how we got the delivery. So some of this money will go towards increased transportation um, infrastructure to get down to the farms. Um, with increased transportation, with increased vehicles comes an increased need for staff to run those, um, to, 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 run the, to do those runs. Uh, we're also looking at a couple other pieces of equipment that will allow us to capture more, particularly of the seconds, and bring them back and to be able to use them uh, in, in our production. One of those pieces is a commercial dehydrator, which will allow us to capture a tremendous amount of stone fruit and uh, fruits and uh, berries 
that we will then be able to dehydrate and use in trail mix, granola, breakfast breads, um, other products that we'll be able to eat or to be able to produce and put into, uh, into our food system. Great. Um, the, there's a this there's a question about uh, how much the DC central kitchen model can be sustainably scaled up to han handle greater demand. Do you have a, a feel for that? Um, well, we, we we sadly we keep scaling up. Um, there's there's always again although we, we our intention is always to shorten the line by the way that we feed it. This line just seems to be getting longer and longer. Uh, so. Uh, I'd say you know, over the last several years, we've increased the number of meals we do by, I don't know, maybe 500 or so um, a day over the course of a year. Um, but that, that has never really been our goal, is to, to serve more meals. Ultimately, our goal is to serve less meals. Um, but the model is incredibly and, and uh, easily scalable. It's just a matter of, of space and facilities. And which is again one of the, the the huge reasons behind us needing to find this secondary facility because where we are right now uh, is a is a decent sized facility but we moved here in 1991 when there was about a staff of four and we were doing maybe 300 meals a day now we're doing between 4,500 and 5,000 meals a day and there's a staff of about 60 working here in the exact same space uh, so we have really maxed out where we are. But we can certainly do more with space, and we've seen that uh, even with the, the, the tens of thousands of pounds of produce that we're bringing in, that's only scratching the very, very tip of an immense iceberg that's out there with product that's going to waste. And if we are successful at shortening the line by the way we feed it, as Mike mentioned, then then we can continue to act as, and will continue to act as, this urban hub for the, all the rural product that we can gather. And if it's not going into meals for low-income communities, then potentially it's going to products that we can sell, which ultimately allows us to sustain the organization and ultimately create jobs as well. That's one of the biggest goals behind it all, is we're creating jobs for our graduates as we get larger. As, oh. Wonderful vision, and I think everyone can see why uh, the DC Central Kitchen and ALBA fits so well into the QFED program. Um, I, I'm going to have to cut off the questions, but uh, people should feel free to continue to ask the questions. Uh, the presenters can answer them in text as I'm uh, as I'm doing the closeout, uh, and we will try to answer as many questions after the webinar as as we're able. Um, so I'd really like to thank all of the presenters today for their presentations. The HUFED program is such a wonderful step towards getting uh, healthy, fair, green, and affordable food to all. ALBA and DC Central Kitchen are such shiny examples of the great work going on across the country. The Wallace Center and the NGFN are always on the lookout for innovative programs such as these, such as these and we'll try to, we try to let you know about them whenever we can to learn from and to be inspired by. Each of the other HUFED grantees are also inspiring, and we'll have some more information about them on the Wallace Center website soon. National Good Food Network webinars are the third Thursday of each month, starting at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. All of our webinars are archived and are accessible on the web at ngfn.org slash webinars. Our next webinar is the third Thursday of September, the 16th. We're getting two huge companies together to talk about how they're purchasing more local and regional food, Cisco and Chipotle. Cisco has been a partner of the National Good Food Network for years, and together we've developed a couple of pilot programs in the Midwest, which have been very fruitful. Cisco is now in the process of taking the learning we did, did together coast to coast. Chipotle has consistently shown their preference for high quality food and a commitment to the triple bottom line. They're sourcing more of their food regionally now. Both companies are great examples of established companies transitioning to more local buying. You'll hear about some of their successes and some of the biggest challenges they've encountered. This should be a stellar webinar. To register for the webinar, go to ngfn.org slash webinars. We also have a growing archive of the NGFN webinars, recordings, slides, written questions and answers, and other resources. Uh, the webinar recording, this one, should be up within a few business days, though likely tomorrow. 
Many of you know that the NGFN publishes a monthly e-newsletter where we collect some of the more notable stories in the scaled up good food world. If you'd like to contribute a story idea or even a story, please let us know. You can always email us at contact at ngfn.org. Uh, and you can uh, see this month's and all previous month's e-newsletters at ngfn.org slash network news. The NGFN wants to keep you updated on the latest in the rapidly moving health food safety domain. Next week, we're very pleased to offer you an opportunity to hear and be heard at the very important United Fresh Produce Gap Harmonization Meeting. United Fresh has been working with its technical working group of food safety professionals to attempt to create a universal gap standard that many of the largest American buyers have agreed to use should they be able to harmonize the existing standards. This squarely addresses the problems that many problem that many growers have, that each buyer has their own food safety standards and some of them are incompatible. You may have heard the term supermetrics. United Fresh has been extremely inclusive of representatives from all scales of agriculture and our own food safety coordinator has been at every meeting. This month, we're letting you in on the meeting from the comfort of your own desk. You'll be able to see the working document as changes are made, exactly what the participants in Philadelphia will be seeing. You will hear the discussion, and you'll be able to offer your suggestions and ask your questions during the meeting. We're using the same webinar technology as we're using today, so you'll have some sense of what it will be like. You can go to ngfn.org slash food safety to register. We, also, we will also have a presentation on September 7th where you can get a summary of the standard and ask your questions. We'll post more information at ngfn.org slash food safety as it becomes available. The NGFN is a convener and as such I want to alert you, alert you to two upcoming events. The next Community Food Security Coalition Conference is in New Orleans October 16 to 19, 14th Annual Community Food Security uh, Coalition Conference. Uh, the, it is uh, the gumbo that unites us all. That's their theme. You can go to communityfoodconference.org. And the It Takes a Region, Northeast Regional Food System Convening is in Albany, New York, November 12 to 13. NISOG, Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group, uh, convenes practitioners, advocates in the Northeast to explore the concept and reality of regional food systems. Um, it Takes a Region.org is your URL for that. Uh, you can find the NGFN on YouTube, Twitter, and our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interests, your bio, and other information to our growing database of people, organizations, and funders, increasing your ability to connect people within your regions and nationally. This is a resource to find people in your regions doing similar or, or, or across the country doing similar or complementary work. It's all part of the NGFN acting as a connector. Look for the database link in the resources section of our website or ngfn.org slash database. And if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage. Please contact, contact us at any time, ngfn.org. Uh, contact at ngfn.org. And the NGFN would like to thank you for your time today. Again, thank you uh, for all these wonderful questions, and we will do our, our best. Once again, let me encourage you to fill out the survey that will open in your web browser in just a moment. And this concludes the webinar.